All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we've got yet more to add to the Clod Buster. We've got a behind the axle steering kit from Clod Shop and a set of three aluminium axle braces to go with the one that comes with the steering bits. This will clean up the look of the front of the truck no end, moving the steering linkage out of harm's way, and I should imagine tighten up the steering feel with a more direct linkage. Very quickly then, we're going to remove the front axle from the chassis, and because there's no drive line, it really is very easy to do. Right, first the wheels need to come off of course, disconnect the steering servo and the motor wires, clip the zip ties to free up the servo cable, Remove the king pins on the top of the axle, remove the servo saver, undo the nut for the top links and remove them from the mount, flip the chassis over and remove the bottom king pins and take away the knuckles, undo the two long screws that attach the lower links and put the rod ends for the anti-roll bar somewhere safe, and that should be the axle free from the chassis. I always quite liked how modular clod builds tend to be. The stock chassis is a bit of a faff, but aftermarket chassis generally make it really easy to work on things. Right, now that's out the way, we can have a look at the goodie bags. First we'll have a look at the braces. You can get a three brace kit like the one we have here that goes with the behind the axle steering kit, or you can get a four brace kit if you want more traditional steering. You get a nice colour card for the instructions, and if you've already done some research on the braces and looked at the website, it's more than good enough. The braces themselves are rather nice. The machine marks are quite pronounced, but I don't mind them. They look a bit holographic. And besides, if you really wanted to, you could show them some polish. In this kit, we get two short braces and a long one. Unlike the stock steel braces, these ones attach to two points on the inside, making them far, far more stable. They will reinforce the axle tubes, keeping them in line, moving the stresses somewhere a bit more sensible. And of course, we get a little bag with some stainless screws to fit them. Just like the chassis, all the bits have a good quality feel. Next, we have the behind the axle steering kit. In a bag, we have the carbon fibre drag link with flanged bearings in the ends. Just like the chassis, it's finished really well. There's no furry carbon bits on the edges. It's just perfect. We also get a special axle brace with the new servo mount. It fits in place of one of the long braces, hence why the brace kit only has the one. Again, it's all top quality stuff. All the parts feel like they're solid and strong and don't have that kind of hollow feeling you get with a lot of low cost brands. I think these parts will probably outlast the old axles, which is saying something, as clod axles usually last pretty much forever. There's the bag of fixings with a couple of rod ends, some screws and various washers. The instructions are of course concise and clear, just like everything else from Clod Shop, but you do have to pay some attention to where the washers go. But other than that, I can't see any gotchas. While I remove the old DIY servo mount, we'll have a quick talk about the main feature of the behind the axle steering kit and why it's a good thing to fit for a performance clod. First of all, it moves all the bits out of harm's way, which is always good, but the main thing is it'll correct the Ackerman. There's a lot of people that can explain it better than me, so if you want more detail, do a search for Ackerman steering. But in short, the inside wheel is trying to follow a smaller radius circle than the outside, so the inside has to steer more. The stock clodbuster setup does the opposite, which, with the steering limiters on the knuckles, stock suspension and stock motors, it does work okay. But when you've got a racy chassis, modified knuckles and more power, you start to feel the steering isn't all that it really should be. Right, so that's the old servo mount off. We'll replace the long countersunk screw with the screw that came with the upper link mount kit, so it'll end up matching the rear axle. We need to be careful keeping track of the washers and spacers. There's the three with the flats on that we really don't want to lose. The rear end of the upper mount comes off next with its long screw, spacer, washer and nylock nut. Because the new axle braces use one of the screw holes that attaches the axle tube to the gearbox, we're going to have to split it. The motor needs to come off with its two screws, then we work our way around the outside and remove the other screws holding the halves together, keeping an eye on the nuts so we don't lose them. 
I'm starting to think that since we've made the rest of the clod look so nice now, those mismatched screws on the axles are really starting to let it down. We might have to get a set of stainless screws to replace the last of the old Tamiya fixings. Maybe we should get some slightly longer ones and replace the old plain nuts with some nylocks while we're at it. Now we can split the gearbox, being careful to try and keep all the gears in one side or the other. It doesn't matter too much if they do fall out, it would just be nice not to get greasy fingers for once. The reason for taking the gearbox apart is this screw at the top of the axle tube. We need to remove it so we can mount the new brace. But first we'll remove the stock brace. There's an M3x6 on the outside that needs to come out. Then there's a self tapper on the inside that's got its own hole. Whip them out and remove the brace. Now we can take the top axle tube screw and nut out and that's this side of the axle ready for rebuild. For the servo mount brace we need a 10, a 12 and a 16 mm screw. The first step of the instructions clearly shows where they go. The brace is a very snug fit on the axle which isn't a bad thing. It means there shouldn't be any major stresses built into the axle when we do up the screws. Before we fit it though, I'm going to use a little bit of thread lock in the threaded holes. Using a liquid blue thread lock, we can use a cocktail stick to transfer a small amount to the threads. Then wipe away any excess with a paper towel. That will keep the thread lock away from the plastic parts, which is fairly important as most thread locks will damage plastic causing it to go brittle, which on an axle really wouldn't be a good thing. Now we can slot the brace into the axle and install the top 12mm screw. We don't want to do it up tight just yet though, we'll leave a little bit of a gap until the other two screws are in. Next from the outside we can thread in the 10mm screw, again don't nip it up just yet. And lastly the 16mm screw goes in from the inside of the gearbox. Now this is the one that we really don't want to fall out, so the thread lock is really useful. If it were to fall out it would probably cause quite a bit of havoc among the gears. Now all three are in we can go around and nip them up. We want to take up the slack making them just snug then tighten them just a little bit more. There's no need to go in any tighter and squash all the plastic parts. Okay other side of the gearbox now so we need to transfer the gears by trying to line up the shafts and flipping the gearbox over. Most of it will probably move over okay, but we'll no doubt need to double check before the rebuild. Just like before, we remove the two screws that attach the stock brace and pull the brace out. Remove the top axle tube screw and nut, and we get a new brace ready. Where you might notice the not so deliberate mistake. Yes, that's the long brace from the brace kit. That's really not going to fit. Unfortunately I sorted out the screws and applied the thread lock to the threaded holes before I noticed. Actually I got as far as trying to fit it in a gap in the axle before the penny dropped. But that's what I get for trying to do a build when I long since should have gone to bed. Anyway, now with the correct short brace thread locked up we can fit it just like the servo mount with a 10, a 12 and a 16mm screw. Pop them in, do them up, and that's the axle half ready to go back together. The thing to remember here is not to force things. You can see I'm struggling a bit to get the halves together. Often you'll have to jiggle it a bit, and maybe give the gears a spin to get things to line up, but they really didn't want to go. If we take it apart again, we can see one of the small bearings has jumped out. Not surprising, and exactly why we don't use too much force. If they don't want to go together, there's almost certainly something amiss inside. With the bearing back in its place, the halves went back together with very little fuss. All the screws can go back in to hold the two halves together next. I really do think we need to get a nice set of stainless screws. We've got two black Phillips head screws on the bottom, a black hex head on the front, and a short silver Phillips on the back. A right old mix. Plus, when we refit the upper link mounts, we'll end up with two stainless screws there. And speaking of the upper link mount, we need to fit the rear of it with the spacer between the mounts and the gearbox with the washer under the nut. And as usual, we're not going to do it up tight just yet. At the front, we need to use the three washers with the flats as a spacer. If you want to get more detail on the chassis bits, check out the third video in the Clodbuster series where we actually fit the axles to the chassis in the first place. With both the screws in for the upper link mount, we can nip up the nuts. 
Now I'm going to refit the motor. We're probably going to need to remove it again later, but it's going to block up the holes in the gearbox just in case we accidentally drop something in. It's just the cover, metal tubes, two screws, so it's no big effort and it will save us having to fish things out. Next we're going to need to sort out the knuckles. Now currently they have the old linkages attached, but we won't be needing any of the old bits. And besides, it's mostly made up from a mix of screws and nuts from various kits. Like most of the original build, it was done on a teenager's budget of not much, so most of the bits came from kit leftovers. I still need to source some washers to sit in the recesses under the kingpins. Or maybe we'll just replace the whole knuckles with aftermarket ones. That's going to get around another problem with one of the other future upgrades too. Anyway, with the knuckles separated from the old linkages, we can install the carbon link. Looking at the picture on the instruction sheet, it's one of those things where when you know how they go together, it's actually really obvious. But until the penny drops, there is a bit of a mystery. The screw that attaches the carbon link to the knuckle has a thick washer that goes under the nut and three smaller washers that space off the centre of the bearing because it's slightly recessed into the carbon. The trouble is, which way up does the knuckle go? If we load up the UK Monsters website, we can look at a high res version of the picture. We can see the thick washer and the nut are on the side of the knuckle that isn't flush. And looking at the knuckle, it all starts to make sense. The flat side has the three small washers and the carbon link. The other side has a hex shaped hole that the thick washer bridges, giving a flat surface for the nut. The carbon link goes under the knuckles, so we need to fit the knuckles so the flat side is towards the bottom of the axle. Now we've worked that out, the instructions make far more sense. Now we've worked that bit out, the instructions do make a lot more sense. We install the countersunk screw with the head on the flange side of the bearing, slide on the three small washers and pass it through the arm on the knuckle. Pop the thick washer over the hex hole, followed by the nut, and tighten it up. Same with the other side, pop the screw in, three small washers, through the knuckle, thick washer and the nut. Make sure it's all nipped up and we've got some steering. And importantly, the inside wheel now steers more than the outside at full lock. Perfect. Next step then, the steering servo. Now we've got the cheap 25kg servo to go back in with the black Kimbro servo saver, which could be a problem. The steering kit is really designed to work with a straight servo arm and the longer of two linkages. With the short linkage, we could always flip the servo over, which will give us all the clearance in the world, but the steering will end up slightly compromised. If we can make it work like this, all the better. We're going to need to remove the motor again so we can get at all the screw holes for the servo. We just have to take a bit of extra care not to drop anything into the gearbox. To make up the linkage we have two grub screws. We want the long linkage so we're going to use the long one and thread it into one of the rod ends. It's got a hex at one end so we can use a 2mm driver to get the thread going. Much nicer than just a length of studding and a fight with a pair of pliers. For now we'll just have a rough guess on the length and adjust it once all the other bits are in position. The servo saver's going to need a screw, something like an M3 by 18 or 20 will probably do. I'm going to thread it in from the inside and then use a nut to attach the ball end when we get to it. To attach the linkage to the carbon link we use the last screw from the kit with its two washers, one on each side of the carbon. There's three holes to choose from. We're going to use the one that gives us the longest linkage, so the linkage stays as straight as possible when turning. Now if we hold the servo in its mount, we can adjust the link length, so when the servo is in its midpoint, the knuckles are nice and straight. It'll take a bit of trial and error, but after some fiddling, it all fits together quite nicely. Now we can fit the servo to its mount with some M3x8s and plain washers. This is just temporary right now, because once everything's perfect, we'll have the screws out again and use a bit of thread lock. Now it's all nice and solid, we can more accurately gauge how bad the clearance issue is. If we turn the steering until the nut collides with the servo saver, we can work out what needs to happen. Turns out, it's very close to actually working. We can, with just a bit of extra force, pop the nut right past the servo saver. The issue is literally just a millimetre or so, 
The easiest thing to do is just trim the side of the servo saver arm straight, removing the section that sticks out. It's just going to need a quick pass with a Dremel. Before we start cutting though, we should very quickly check there's clearance between the motor and the other end of the linkage. I'm sure it will be fine, but just in case we'll hold the motor onto the gearbox and have a look. And it looks like we've got a good 2 or 3 millimeter gap, which is more than good enough. Very nice. Right, now we can pop the servo saver off and attack it with the Dremel. The plan is to trim a couple of millimetres off each side. We might as well do both, just so it looks nice and even. And a little bit later, we have a modified servo saver. Now, before we refit it, we're going to need to power up the servo to make sure it's in the centre. I'm using a servo tester, but you can always just hook it up to a radio, but make sure the trims are zeroed. Once the servo saver is screwed on, we can pop the linkage over the screw thread and fit a nut. For now, I'm just going to use a plain nut so it's easy to remove, but we will replace it with a nylock for the final assembly. Right, with all the bits in place, we can see if it actually works. Well, that looks pretty good. Super smooth with no real detectable slop at all. Awesome stuff. Looking at it from the side, you can see it's a bit tight, but it'll do the job. So that's the dry build complete. We can take the steering bits off again and do the final assembly. We need to remove the linkage from the servo, remove the knuckles with the carbon link, and remove the four screws attaching the servo. Now, so the servo doesn't come adrift, we're going to use some thread lock in the holes in the mount. They're going to be really difficult to get at once the axle's back on the chassis, so we want to make sure that they're not going to back out. Just as before, we'll use a tiny amount of thread lock and wipe off the excess. Then we reattach the servo. Next, the motor goes back on with its plate, metal tubes and two screws. Nip them up, and that's the axle ready to go back onto the chassis. OK, starting with the chassis upside down, we use the long screws to attach the lower links and anti-roll bars with the rod ends. The only thing to watch out for is the rod ends need to be aligned so the ball can move with the anti-roll bars without bending the plastic. Flip the chassis over and feed in the steering parts, loosely popping the knuckles onto the axle. Refit the upper links to the upper mount's middle hole so the axle isn't wobbling around. Refit the kingpins two on the top and two on the bottom. Make sure the steering's all nice and smooth and isn't binding. If it's a little bit stiff, you probably just need to back off the kingpins just a touch until it frees up. Now from the side, we can pop the steering linkage over the servo saver screw and fit a nylock nut. There's really not that much space in there, but it all works. You can see why we thread lock those other screws too. With the motor in the way and the axle on the chassis, there's no clean way to get at them, so you really don't want them to fall out. Before we start zip tying wires down, we should probably just do a quick test to make sure it's all actually going to work. We can plug the servo into the receiver and power up the track. Now we're going to need to adjust the trim just a little bit to get the steering straight. We will probably need to adjust it a little bit more once the truck's back on its wheels too. It's always difficult to get it spot on unless the truck's actually rolling. And while we're here, we might as well set the end point so the servo isn't overdriving the linkage. All we do is hold the steering wheel to one end while in the end point menu and adjust the value until the servo isn't quite stressing. Interestingly, it's almost spot on to 100% in both directions, about as close to perfect as you're ever likely to see. The only issue might be because we've got more steering on the inside wheel, the tyre is going to get even closer to the lower linkage at full lock, so we might need to make the wheel wideners just a little bit wider. In the short term, we can just reduce the endpoints a little bit, but that's something we're going to need to check. Next up, we need to plug the motor back into the ESC, and because we're using black wires on both the motor terminals, we're going to need to do a quick check to make sure it's spinning the right way. We just need to lift the rear axle and give it a bit of throttle. And that looks just fine. Right, now we know it's all going to work, we can route the servo cable somewhere safe and use some zip ties to keep it out of harm's way. We need to make sure there's some slack around the points that see movement so nothing gets pulled on and that it can't get pinched as the suspension moves. 
Unfortunately, that does mean that the servo cable comes up just slightly short. Now we could rearrange the radio layout just a little bit to get round it. Flipping the receiver 180 degrees would probably do it on its own. But for now, we're just going to use an extension cable. The only one I have at hand is far too long, but it will get us going. I'll fold it up and tuck the excess in the gap between the receiver and the ESC. Once it's in, it doesn't look too bad, but we'll give it a proper tidy up at some point in the future. Now we can pop the wheels back on and see what the clearances look like. And at full lock, the tyre does indeed come in contact with the lower link. So we're going to need to make it a little bit wider, probably adding five or ten millimetres. There's going to be a fair bit of experimentation there, so we'll look at that another time. And for now, just reduce the endpoints a little bit, as mentioned earlier. Otherwise, I'm extremely pleased with the new steering. You can see even on the bench, it looks very sharp with almost no wobble as we go lock to lock. That's going to give us some very precise steering. With the body back on, the only downside is it looks a bit bare up front. The body being mounted slightly forward really doesn't help either. I think we're going to need some sort of low profile bumper in there just for looks. We'll have to have a think. That just leaves the last two axle braces for the rear. However, they're exactly the same as the front ones, just without the steering mount, so I won't go over the build again. The front and rear gearboxes are exactly the same, so you've already got the idea. Fitted, they do look rather nice though, a lot more solid than the stock parts. Buzzing around outside, the steering feels rather good, very precise. We won't get a good idea how well it's going to handle though, until we fit some faster motors. The chassis is so far within its limits at full throttle, nothing really bothers it in the slightest. It's quite amusing to compare to a stock rod where every little bump tends to send it off course. It's amazing how far you can take those old axles. I'm not going to be uploading a second video this week. Apparently lockdown means everybody goes to the woods for a walk at the same time. All the car parks are full with cars, parked right up to my usual local test ramp, so all I could really do was trundle up and down by this bit of road, which really doesn't make for great video. Anyway, that's going to do for this week. As always, thanks for watching. Like if you like, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment if there's something on your mind. Bye guys!